So I arrived to this place and I immersed myself in two or three hours of continuous movement and dancing with strangers. And it was one of the most incredible experiences of my life. I, I remember by the end feeling as alive as I, I didn't feel for a very long time. It was t totally ecstatic, blissful experience. Welcome to this new episode and today I am here with Francisco. How are you Francisco? Very good. Excited to be here. He is uh, an awesome uh, dan contact dance practitioner and also teacher. Mm -hmm. And uh, you have to know that in Copangan, Francisco's community of uh, uh, contact dance has been developing uh, a lot. So I'm very interested in learning more about your thoughts, about this beautiful practice. And uh, also you have knowledge on the Tao. So we can also touch upon that. But first of all, I'd like to ask you, what is your journey in life up until now? Okay, so I was born in um, the Azores Islands. I don't know, many of you probably will not know um, this place. Uh, it's not very known. It's a group of islands which belongs to Portugal in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. And uh, you actually need to take a plane from Lisbon two hours to get there. The mentality is quite the same. There is a yeah, kind of consensus. We come from a Catholic background. I think I was quite an innocent child and I just believe what people told me. Um, but then I became a, a, a teenager and I remember something that really touched me was philosophy class. Mm -hmm. And, and in philosophy was the first time, um, except my mother, my mother usually questioned things and made me question things, which was great. She didn't have this position when she would say, the world is like that, and I know. She would kind of say, I think it's like this, but really, really, I don't know. And I think that that uh, fueled a lot my curiosity because she's kind of saying you have to find for yourself because I cannot say it is like that and so it, it, it allowed me to, to, to go on asking questions mm -hmm. and in philosophy it was the first class I had where the teacher was not just you know kind of imposing some ideas upon me. The teacher was helping me to question things and find my own answers. And that was revolutionary for me. Yeah, I guess I can touch on that. I also was introduced to marijuana. Mm -hmm. at, that, at that point I was maybe 14, 15, totally irresponsible. And I really liked the effect it had on me. Mm -hmm. um, I remember being very conscious of myself and held back, uh, kind of a bit of a socially awkward at that time. Mm -hmm. And when I smoked with my friends, all of these layers of being so shy and, uh, yeah, kind of serious, making a, a certain role that I need to perform, all of this would just dilute and we would just become more real for me. Just what is real is what we're manifesting in that moment. And then it kind of went in a wrong direction uh, as I started to use it to numb myself mm. from reality, from, from the my life. So my relationship at home with family was not so good. Um, I didn't find m a function in the world or wh where do I belong and 
It was a very confusing time of my life. And so I had these two things combined, which was very powerful. That was video games All right. and smoking uh, pot. Um, but at some point, I started to have a lot of anxiety from smoking mm. and playing. Like, I couldn't focus on any other things in my life. I was in university, I went to study architecture. Uh, and again, I was quite good, but it demanded a lot of work. It started to give me a lot of anxiety and started to turn into panic attacks. Wow, that's very serious anxiety. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm. Uh, it, and it had to do with the disembodiment, I believe. Because mm -hmm. you were too much in your head, basically. Mm? Yeah, basically, I, I would think a lot, think a lot, like I would read books, think a lot about the world, about life, um, play video games, which was basically all your body is still, only you're moving your hands and your eyes. And you're going through a lot of adrenaline, actually, mm -hmm. but it's not going anywhere. You yeah, know. the body is kind of limp. It's not you're not moving your body yeah. at all. Hovered above my body, you know, mm -hmm. as an entity, you know, as myself would kind of be out of the body. Uh, I am here, behind my eyes, and my feet are there, far away from me. Mm -hmm. But I'm here somewhere. Yeah, and I think that's kind of the natural experience for many people. But I started to question that. So the philosophy would go into, who am I? Mm -hmm. Finally, my grandfather helped me because he saw I was in a very difficult time and wasting my potential as a human being. And we found a, an online program which would um, find me a job where I would get paid abroad. Okay. And I went to Iceland. Iceland, I remember now, yeah. Interesting place. Eh? Very interesting place. Amazing. Mm -hmm. I, I really recommend for anyone to visit. It's something totally out of this planet. And this book was The Power of Now. Yeah, for sure. E Power Eckhart Tolle. From Eckhart Tolle. Mm. And I remember going to the airport on the day that I was leaving. I actually went, uh, I had went out last night and I drink and I smoke at the last time as a goodbye to my, all of my friends and my old life. And I had just slept one hour and I'm coming to the airport and I'm in deep, like severe anxiety. Mm. Like, oh my God, I'm going alone to another country with this condition, full of fear, disembodied, a lot of confusion in my head, and I'm just gonna go to somewhere I don't know. And that was a huge leap of faith. My heart beating so much, and everything kind of looks fine outside, but you're in a total mess, and you think you're just, you're just gonna die, just there. That's kind of a bit of what a panic attack feels like. Mm -hmm. You're pretty much feeling like you're dying and you don't know from what or when. And it's a very intense somatic experience. Very intense feeling, cannot think properly, cannot calm yourself down. And, uh, it just comes to you and uh, you're just overwhelmed by yeah, it. Yeah, and you also, do, you also, f uh, there is also this social layer where you're freaking out, you don't know from where, and you don't really want to show it to people around. Because it's embarrassing almost. Because it's very embarrassing. Yeah. You don't know what's happening. It yeah. happened to me once as well, only once in my life, in the office. Mm. It was like the beginning of my huge change in life as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I, I also, it's amazing, like it's a very strange experience. Very strange experience. For me, I couldn't breathe, you know, I, I was having a heart attack. Yes. I collapsed in the streets actually, and then on the London Underground. Wow. Until they called the security and they put me into a medical room and did an electrocardiogram. Mm -hmm. 
and uh, my heart was fine, so it was no heart attack, but mm -hmm. just a panic attack. Mm -hmm. But only once, thanks God, and uh, since then, I changed my life completely on the back of it. So I, ca I can relate to what you say. Yes. So, and, so you were in Iceland at some point, so after this, and uh, is that when you go into dancing or feeling your body more? Not yet. Not no. yet. At, at that point, I was just uh, quitting uh, the, my addiction with marijuana and uh, I started to work, which was pretty much my first time being independent. Uh, I, had, uh, I was working at a hotel. Basically, I was a very disembodied being until I found something called Aikido. Mm, Japanese uh, martial arts. Japanese isn't it? martial art, yes. And there, they were practicing in Reykjavik, in the capital of, of Iceland. And I would go there, and it was the first time when physical contact with people was normal. You know, we could just play with our bodies. That was fine. Throw ourselves around, men and women, no difference. And we would just practice Aikido together. And being my, our bodies work with energy. And I was totally fascinated by that. By shifting the center of my existence, basically from a thinking self somewhere out of the body to being an embodied being and they talk a lot about the hara. The, yeah, the belly area. The is belly that? is kind of the center of your vital energy and the seat of your soul as some people mention in, in Aikido. So you move a lot, from, you exist here, mm -hmm. not somewhere behind your eyes. So that was an antidote to your panic attacks potentially. Exactly. You started thinking maybe by moving your energy to the body, you might have more control over uh, the anxiety, is that yes. right? Or? And just also the anxiety, I realized, would also come up with the fear of the future. Mm -hmm. Like, oh, maybe a panic attack is going to happen there, but it's an imagination. And so I was learning to be with what is now. Yeah. And uh, surrender to that experience. Yeah, the two things together are very powerful, like being present and being embodied at the same time. Exactly. Well, I see where you're going. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, I don't know if even they can be separate because you, you're just present with what's happening now, not an imagination of future or a memory of the past. Yeah. And that experience can also be very intense. But through the book of Power of Now, he basically teaching you to surrender to this moment and you can find peace whenever you let go of resisting to what's happening now. And I would just practice that. If I, if I would have panic sensations, I would not think what might happen in the future mm -hmm. um, and I would not fight or try to change the experience. I would close my eyes and totally let go and experience this intense sensations in my body without trying to push them away, just being with them. Yeah, that's a lesson number one, right? If you're feeling a little bit uh, you know, anxious, depressed, any kind of negative emotion you might have related to the future or the past, and mm -hmm. uh, you realize you are having this negative emotion, a quick fix is to just be present in the now, bring yourself back to the now, don't think about it, if you can, obviously. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's really powerful already. Yeah. yeah, and I found that there is usually a sensation that I'm resisting. Like there is this beating heart which I'm scared. Because it's vulnerable. Mm -hmm. It's very vulnerable to be a beating heart because it can stop. Can you imagine <gasps> every one second or one and a half seconds it beats? Yeah. What if it stops? <laughs> If you start thinking about, I mean, of course, people don't think about stuff like that. Yeah, but yeah, if yeah. you are a little bit prone to anxiety or you're a more of introvert kind yeah, of yeah. person, mm -hmm. you might have like realizations <laughs> like that and I start, start feeling the heart might stop beating. And I did a Vipassana in the UK, mm -hmm. 10 days, 
and then I came here to Thailand, not Koh Phangan yet. I was in a community called the Mindfulness Project, which is a very beautiful place if you ever come to Thailand. I don't know if the, if the project could still be going on when you watch this, as COVID had a really big impact on the community. Um, it's an amazing place. I spent there three months. That's what. That's when the lockdown happened. Yeah. Happened. So I was. I arrive in Thailand. I'm in this community. Amazing people, based on Buddhist teachings, yoga practice, uh, permaculture, uh, organic meals, vegetarian community living. It's meeting incredible people there. Nice. And I think I'm going to stay here for one month and then maybe I go to Cambodia or some other place in Thailand. And then <laughs> lockdown happens. So after uh, learning Aikido and also the power of now, yes. uh, you move to Thailand. And uh, how do you find uh, contact dance? I come to Koh Phangan for a yoga teacher training. Mm -hmm. Um, I wanted to find a vocation which was meaningful for my life. That was also part of my journey, to, uh, uh, why I decided to leave Iceland, to come to, to Southeast Asia, yeah. to find this vocation. Like, how can I serve the world with the gifts I have mm -hmm. and, 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 and work? To, how can I make money while doing something I love? And, and that it's good for people. Yeah, it's a question many people in Copangan have. Yeah. So they want to learn something that is not the standard jobs, the standard office work, exactly. and uh, empowers people, like they want to become teachers, healers, uh, coaches, mm -hmm. etc. And that was also your intention. Yes. Mm. And uh, maybe a word, Ikigai, here. Uh, I don't know if ever any of you heard about this. It's a Japanese con concept for happiness for a for a fulfilled life nice. basically if you want to i won't go into detail in there but uh, if you want to google that ikigai very interesting way to find a, a good life i find and so i am taking this yoga teacher training mm -hmm. in one yoga very amazing place mm -hmm. also if you are uh, in interested in this kind of things um, and about two weeks, I, I go to the dome. I have an amazing experience with voice. I meet amazing people there. Uh, and I meet a friend from Portugal. We're singing together in the sauna. And he then in the end tells me, oh, I'm a dancer. There's this thing, uh, contact dance, uh, contact improvisation, which you might like. Uh, and I say, OK, maybe I try. And then again, I'm in my yoga teacher training, and one of my teachers was facilitator of contact improvisation. And this thing coming again, and I become curious about it. So I have a, a whole day of classes, and then people say, OK, come to the jam, which is basically a place where people practice contact improvisation in quite a free way, so there is no not a fixed structure, uh, not fixed steps and, and fixed music. Nothing is fixed, basically. Yeah. So there's uh, some guidelines maybe some to, guidelines. to help facilitate exactly. uh, connection and flow, yes. but no strict rules. Uh, you can move as you like. Yes, as long as you don't bring violence to the space, <laughs> this kind of things. Um, so I arrived to this place and I immersed myself in two or three hours of continuous movement and dancing with strangers. And it was one of the most incredible experiences of my life. I, I remember by the end feeling as alive as I, I didn't feel for a very long time. It was a totally ecstatic, blissful experience. <laughs> and that's, the rest is history, pretty much. So you've been dancing a lot, right? You've been part of dancing festivals. And uh, this is, how big is uh, 
contact dance or contact improvisation in your in your life right now? So right now, it uh, contact has become my my way of living, in a way that it's uh, it's also a practice that has a philosophy behind it, which can be uh, implemented in in the way you move in the world. Mm -hmm. um, and so today it becomes my life. I'm teaching it. I am finding my way to make it as, as my profession, as my living, as the way to, to survive in this world, which at the moment is, is difficult uh, because, yeah, there's something about, I love it so much and I want to make it accessible for everyone. And this is also motto of the community mm -hmm. that money shouldn't be the reason why we practice or teach. Yeah. But at the same time, we need to eat. Tell us a little bit more about uh, contact improv or contact improvisation. Um, how does it work? So there's uh, a bunch of people coming into a space. Uh, often it's a yoga shala, but it could be different kind of spaces. Yeah. And uh, usually there is a facilitator or somebody that kind of like brings people together. What kind of music do you use? So that's the most peculiar thing about contact, is that sometimes we dance in silence. Mm -hmm. And this is very challenging or surprising for, for new people, because people are used to move through music. But what the founders of contact improvisation, so found is that music can overpower you, overpower your own expression. Yeah, because it brings lots of emotions. It brings lots of emotions. Strong resonance. It takes you in the mood. It makes your body move in a beat. I mean, it's easy to get carried by the music uh, and go into different spaces, which is great. I, I personally sure. love it. Sure, any kind of dance is amazing. It's an embodied experience and it's a flowing experience and it's lovely, right? So you say sometimes music, sometimes p silence? Sometimes silence. So present in the moment, present that's really important. Moment, exactly. And try to connect with the other people because you got a flow and you have to co-create some sort of movements, right? Because you rely on other people as well, moving and... In, or how, how, does it, how can you explain it for somebody that uh, hasn't tried it yet? So every time I'm teaching, I have to ask my s this question again and again and again. Mm -hmm. And it's a discussion that goes on even in our community. What is contact improvisation? And uh, it's difficult to define it because from the beginning, it's not trademarked. You know, it's not like many kinds of dances that the creator said this is it this is my thing this is what i do and this is what you should be doing under my name and da 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 da, da. so he didn't want to do anything like that he cre he was researching it was based on research and interesting that this research is very connected to aikido oh okay because he was aikido practitioner Oh, okay, okay. And he was, f uh, he, not only Aikido, he was fascinated by Tai Chi, Qigong, yoga and meditation and all of these Eastern philosophies and practices. And I think he was finding that he was a, a, a modern dancer. His name was Steve Paxton. Mm -hmm. And he's still alive today. The practice... Uh, is now to, it's the 50 years of anniversary this year wow. uh, of, of, of contact improvisation. And he created a revolution in the world of dance because he studied ballet and modern dance and, and different kind of things, but most of it was choreographed and most of it was based on aesthetics and visual, visual aesthetics. For the audience, yeah. For the audience. Mm -hmm. And um, pretty much about showing some forms. Yeah. He started to research with movement 
and uh, the laws of physics it was pretty much like a pragmatic scientist which found a lot of beauty and uh, fascination by the laws of the universe the okay. laws of physics yeah natural law gravity yeah. momentum inertia all of these things he was fascinated by this um, not just the ideas but the embodiment of those forces if i'm here um, i have my own center of mass of gravity i'm being pulled to the ground i'm pretty much independent from you i think but when we come to falling towards each other like this imagine this is yep. your body this is my body and we literally become we have one center of mass shared yeah it, i'm not an independent body of physics anymore because we lean on each other yeah we become a shared structure yes and so they the 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 contact improvisation comes from from this research on what's possible together when we become a shared structure that's lovely so i think the dynamics of it are quite clear and also the sort of the physical aspect you said there is a philosophy uh, you mentioned that um, uh, well there is a philosophy of freedom if you want because mm -hmm. there's no real structure or real mm -hmm. rules mm -hmm. can you explain more about the philosophy of contact improv no one is uh, overpowering the other right yeah. so for example in many dance forms there is the man leading and the woman following yeah right and and here we are uh, rebelling against that idea that uh, that uh, someone is leading someone is following so we can we are both equals so there is no hierarchy you're not above better you're not guiding we come as equals and we meet as equals that's nice it doesn't matter who you are how old are you mm -hmm. where you come from if you're a man if you're a woman potentially even they were teaching disabled people to dance even people on wheelchairs blind people uh, and so bringing dance to wherever people are that they yeah they don't need to, 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 to do anything different through this falling towards and becoming one object mm -hmm. sometimes in, in, in really physical language I can start to feel as if you are part of me yeah as, as if but it's not an imagination it's a very felt experience uh, as if your body is an extension of my body yeah and and you if this experience is shared it's incredible as i see it now and again i cannot define it, this is my own experience of it it is uh, an exploration of how does it feel to be an embodied being and how much can i feel these laws of physics in my body so again coming back to embodiment i'm not a thinking self which is outside of life mm -hmm. commenting on things but i am part of life francisco i know that uh, you are now moving to chamai what are you doing in chamai so Chiang Mai is going to be the big final closure of, of, of this chapter in Thailand. Of course, I plan to come back, but for now, this year is the celebration of 50 years of contact improvisation. Yep. And uh, my teachers and, and community and I belong also to, to also going to teach there and helping to organize. Uh, the conference, so contact improvisation conference in Thailand to celebrate the 50 years of contact improvisation. Coming up in Chiang Mai, which Coming up in when Chiang is Mai, it exactly? It's beginning on the 18th of July and it's pretty much going to be a one month program uh, with three different parts that people can attend. 
and it's a very beautiful landmark that's not just about Thailand, but it's a gathering of any practitioner of contact around the world to come and help to develop the form to find where it's going because it's always moving somewhere Indeed. and it's still in development. <laughs> Well, that's lovely. Thank you very much for this little chat. Yeah, I wish you best of luck for the conference in Chiang Mai and then Portugal and when you come back again, Thank hopefully you so soon. Much.